Good morning. Expecting someone else? No, this isn't a message from royalty. But in a way, when we come together to worship, in fact, we are remembering a certain kind of royalty and the importance of Christ, our own king. And even more than that, our own dignity as his own royal family, adopted by his grace and our faith in Jesus. Now, maybe dignity seems like a bit of a stretch at this moment. I wonder how casual you are right now at this moment. It maybe doesn't seem right. In fact, I've always been a bit jealous of those of you who've been doing online church, getting to relax with your coffee while we get everything ready in the sanctuary. But actually, I don't feel that way right now. Lately, all I have hoped for you and for our community is peace and comfort in these crazy times. So let me ask you a question for reflection before we pray and before we begin. So where do you turn for help, for comfort? I'm sure that you've noticed by now that there are a lot of options out there to find comfort. But none of them really bring the deeper peace that the heart needs. In Psalm 122, the writer asks a similar question about where his true help comes from. So hear the word of the Lord. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So I call you to worship this December 26th. Wherever you are, whatever kind of slippers you happen to be wearing, as long as you come to worship, as the Lord says, in spirit and in truth. Let's give him our full attention for the next short time, and you will find the help and comfort that you need from him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you promised that we would find mercy and receive grace in our time of need. And so we lift our eyes from all the other places and we turn to you where our help comes from. Amen. Good morning, Cedarview. We hope you had a wonderful Christmas. I'm Mandy and this is Mackenzie. And please join us as we begin our time of worship.
Good morning, Cedarview. Uh, my name is Blair, and uh, a little while ago, Pastor Mike um, emailed me with, with his sermon ideas uh, coming into uh, to Advent and into Christmas. And he was uh, planning on doing some things around why we sing. Like, what, what is it about singing and Christmas and Advent that makes all of these things fit together? And, and I, like, I don't know if you've been watching either in the sanctuary or online, but uh, the, there's been a lot of different um, takes on that. And we've uh, been able to walk through some reasons why we sing. And uh, I didn't realize, though, that when Pastor Mike sent this, that there was going to be a little catch at the end. And he's like, well, and maybe you could just preach on, on Boxing Day. Now, for those who don't really know, um, Boxing Day is the traditionally the youth pastor's Sunday, uh, which means that the senior pastor has been pushing and pushing and pushing, and now they're done. And now we bring in the youth pastor. So I was surprised when Matt was preaching a couple of weeks ago. And I'm like, oh, no, I am the youth pastor Sunday preacher. Um, and so um, despite that, I'm actually quite uh, happy and glad to, to be here and to be able to try to think and talk about um, songs and gifts and God uh, in our midst. So uh, settle in for a moment and let's uh, just think about uh, what kind of day Boxing Day is. It's, it's this strange day when you try to explain to people um, in other places, often in the United States, my friends are like, Boxing Day, what, what's that? It's this strange day where we kind of, at least in my house when I was growing up, we got to sit around in our pajamas and we got to read books and listen to music This is and play games. And occasionally my mom would do a puzzle. Um, so I'm not sure whether or not that's your tradition, but it's my tradition. And we always knew that we would have books to read because um, I have a, an uncle who used to own bookstores, uh, work or owned bookstores. And he was in British Columbia and we were in Ontario, and these were the days before people flying all over the place. And so we would never see him. In fact, we, we rarely saw him because we lived on different sides of the, the country and it was too expensive to fly. But every year this box would arrive. Uh, remember Canada Post, long before Amazon. I know that surprises you that some of you, that I'm old enough to remember days before Amazon. But yes, days before Amazon. And it would be filled with books chosen for me and my brother and my mom and my dad. And remember, we haven't really seen my uncle. And so it's not like he would get a list from us or that he really kind of hung out with us. But he would talk to us a little bit during the year. And then every year he'd choose books just for us. And I've, I've still got a bunch of those books. And I... I, my kids read those books. They're amazing. Some of my favorite books in the world were books that I got from my uncle, Gary. And I always knew I was going to have music because I have a, an uncle, Jim, who's actually an accountant, but uh, he, his real life is music. Uh, he sings in a, a choir that's toured around in Europe. Um, he's part of this thing called Choir, Choir, Choir in Toronto. So if you are uh, go on YouTube and just Google Choir, 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 and uh, I won't tell you which one he is, but sometimes he's in the videos and uh, he's done all kinds of interesting things with that. And he has the largest CD collection I have ever seen and imagined. It's not measured in hundreds. It's measured in thousands and in tens of thousands of CDs. So every year I would get books and CDs or cassettes or records um, from these uncles. One year they got together and I got this book. This is the Rolling Stone album guide. Remember, days before the internet, days before you would like, you, you would get reviews in the newspaper of new music. This came out first in 79, 
then in 83, and then was updated in 92. I was eagerly anticipating this update. And it's really just record reviews, album reviews, hundreds of them. And I would go through, and there's still these little marks in here of the albums that I wanted and the albums that I had. This is a bookmark from a concert ticket that I had. This kept me occupied for decades, uh, trying to go through the Rolling Stone album guide. Why does this matter? Well, it strikes me that music and books, especially when they're given as gifts, have some similar characteristics. Now, you might not be a really big music person, um, but if you are watching this, you're, you're likely engaged in some way in, in music. Churches are this strange place because it's one of the only places where we have public music that still happens. You don't sing, I guess if you go to a hockey game or something, you sing the national anthem, but we don't sing elsewhere. And especially in days of COVID, we don't, you're not supposed to, to speak moistly uh, outside. You're not supposed to project. And so we're not even singing, maybe even by ourselves. And so song and music is somehow connected to a deeper meaning and is connected to something in in case of the church, in, it's connected to something of God. But it's also, even if it's not connected to God, it's somehow connected to meaningful moments in our lives. You might remember certain songs that played uh, when, when you got married. What was your first song when you, uh, when you did your dance? You can ask ask Pastor Matt if he had a first dance song uh, in his recent wedding. Whatever, it could be uh, a, a particular hymn that always reminds you of something. I know that I have songs, I've been to funerals, and some of the, the most profound moments of God's presence have been when the, the gathered congregation have sung this person into the next kingdom. So singing has this profound place in our life. It's something that we can do together. It's something that can mark a moment. It can give expression to words that we can't say. And not only that, but I want to highlight three things that go along with that. But first, before I get into those things, we need some scripture. So this comes from the gospel uh, according to Luke. And it's in Luke 2. And uh, it should be super familiar to many of you. Uh, maybe some of you, it'll be totally new, and that would be great. But it's Luke, it starts at Luke 2, verse 8. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look! I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, a Savior who is Messiah the Lord was born for you in the city of David. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in cloth and lying in a feeding trough. Suddenly, there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and singing, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, 
the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the feeding trough. And after seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. So that's likely a familiar story. And I think that that's one of the problems with Christmas, if I'm being honest. And it can be one of the problems with music. So things become very familiar. And when something so familiar as the Christmas story, you no longer are shocked by it or no longer are moved by it in quite the same way. What happens is, is that Christmas somehow becomes nostalgic. And, uh, and nostalgia, while it's fine, is really actually stopping us from experiencing new life. Nostalgia says there was something that was in the past that made me feel good or made me feel happy or made me feel joyful or peaceful. And I am going to return back to that thing, and maybe it's a song, um, and maybe it's this story, maybe it's a cr Christmas tradition, we always do this at this time, and as long as this happens, then I can feel peaceful or joyful or like it's the Christmas season. And of course I want everybody to feel like it's the Christmas season. But the passage that we read today the shepherds are not exactly filled with nostalgia. The shepherds are not exactly putting up their Christmas tree and singing um, songs that remind them of God's glory, right? If we're going to be honest, right, the story starts with just everyday guys out at night, likely complaining about something. Some of them are likely happy about the fact that their sheep are nearby. Some of them are likely stressed about what's going on back at home. But they're, they're just going about their work day. And then Luke tells us a couple of times, suddenly, like, it's not like they were planning this. The shepherds are there, and all of a sudden, there's an angel coming from heaven, right? The last time that God spoke in this kind of way to a large group of people was hundreds of years before that. Now, it's not like we think that God was totally silent. We had, we had scripture and God uh, continued to be present to God's people through that and through the priests and through worship. But scripture doesn't record. There's a big silence between God speaking in the Old Testament and God speaking again in the New Testament. And I don't know about you, but if it was me and there was hundreds of years of silence, it's not like I would be going out around my everyday work thinking, oh, maybe an angel is going to appear today because, you know, it happened 300 years ago. No. The shepherds were shocked. They were surprised. The angels suddenly appeared. So the first thing that I want us to note about music and singing and good gifts is that they catch us by surprise. You can't anticipate what is going to happen because you don't know what the song is about or what it, how it's going to hit you at that particular moment. There's something that catches you. There's something that is surprising about that. So my hope would be that somehow at Christmas time that the gospel that today in the village nearby the savior of the world was born would be something that would be new and surprising for you. That it would be able to break through some of the nostalgia and maybe 
this year the nostalgia is painful because we've been going through COVID or because something's been going on in your life and maybe you've got grief. Because we can't forget that sometimes surprises aren't good. Sometimes they're bad. But in this case, in the case of the shepherds, the news is good. Suddenly, the Savior of the world is there. Now, some of you are likely like, you may have already turned it off because you're like, I don't want to be rescued from nostalgia. I want my nostalgia, please. Well, the second thing that we have to note about um, the passage is, is that even though the message was surprising, the message was not new. So if the problem around surprise is nostalgia, then the problem around this, the second part of this message would be novelty. Our world really loves novelty. I don't know if you, uh, like we could go through every year and there seems to be some kind of gift that is nearly impossible to get. Um, if you're looking for PlayStation 5s or if you're looking for Cabbage Patch Kids, I don't care what decade you're in, whatever decade that is, there's some kind of latest in thing. I've been watching a, a TV show uh, with, with our our nine-year-old, and uh, we've been watching the series of unfortunate events, uh, which is pretty witty. And there's one character in there who is always looking for what is in. And so they go to a restaurant that's supposed to be in, and they're all happy. And then all of a sudden, the newspaper comes out that says, this other restaurant is in. And so she immediately gets up and says, this is out, and I am going in. And off she goes. There's always something that's new, that's in, that we want. And we could mistake the, this sort of um, drive to always have something new as being surprising. But the shepherds don't receive a, a message that's new. They already know about God. They already know that God has been dealing with God's people in redemptive ways. They've been part of the covenant that God has had with God's people for centuries. They know that they are Israel and that God is their God. The surprising part is that God has come in this way, but the message of redemption, the message of grace, the message of joy and peace that they are to receive is the same message that they have heard their entire lives. It is not something that's novel that they need to chase, that they need to, to do that's new. Now, I drive, I have teenagers, so I drive around a lot. This is, I, my second career is Uber driver, but I only have two clients, my 17 year old and my 13 year old. And I drive around and they always are choosing um, the radio station and they're always choosing, like, they can hear a song for three seconds and they say, no, don't like it, new station. No, don't like it, new station. And then when it gets there, oh, this is new, I like it. The gospel isn't new, I like it. The gospel, it's not classic rock either, but it is something that has got lasting, staying power, that has withstood the test of time and is able to bring peace no matter what the circumstances, is able to proclaim grace no matter what is going on. And so don't fall to top 40 novelty. Look for something that is going to be able to carry on. The third thing that we've got um, going on is that um, good music and in this story, leads us to do something, right? If, if the problem is nostalgia and surprise and novelty and lasting power, then inertia, the, like sitting on your couch doing nothing is the problem. Like I have got 
great headphones. My kids make fun of me because they're the big over the ear kind because I like to hear my music and I'm going deaf. So I really need like the good headphones. I don't walk around with ear pods in my, my ears. But those big headphones are hard to walk around with. You just kind of sit in your chair and listen to the music. But that's not what happens in this passage. The angels come and they sing, and then the shepherds go. Not only do they go, they go and they see, they see Mary and Joseph, and the text is really clear, they see the baby and the trough. They actually go and see something, but then they go again. Not back to the trough, not back to seeing that, but they go and they send the message around. They go back to their fields and they start to proclaim things. When the glory of the Lord shines around them, and when the song of the angels is sung to them, they don't just go <gasps> and stop. They don't put their headphones on and cut themselves off from the world. It is a song that drives them out to do something about it. I think Christians likely have an advantage here over uh, people who just listen to music on the radio or through their streaming device, whatever they're going to do. Because we know that music is meant to be moved to. We know that music is meant to be sung with your people. Some of you will know that um, I used to live in, in Malawi, which is a small country in Central Africa. And the house that I lived in bordered on a road that went to the main, the biggest uh, cemetery in Malawi. And so there were funerals every day um, going on this road, just separated by a chain link fence from my yard. And these huge trucks, big, um, you know, lorries, delivery trucks, would, be, would come by every day filled with the women's guild from whatever church the deceased was part of. And they would sing. Like you could just, I should have recorded it because you had this, I didn't understand a word of it, but I knew everything that they were saying. They were both praising God and praying for the people that they loved and being grateful that they could be together and that they could be the church and sing. And um, the song moved you and moved me and moved them to action, to reaching out with compassion and love and to reaching out um, with a word of, of consolation when the person was in grief or the people were in grief. And that's what good songs do. If you ever drive by me, you'll see that my head is moving when I'm listening in the car. Don't make fun. I know that if the song is good, you also do that. So, music can move us, and the gospel should move us. It's Boxing Day, so I think you should likely just try to listen to some good music today. And maybe it'll be Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Maybe it'll be Celine Dion. You could ask Pastor Matt for that clip of Celine. Maybe not Celine. Don't. Maybe not. But whatever it is, know that at the Christmas season, the gospel comes to us in surprising ways. It catches us where we're at in profound, profound depth. And it won't leave us the way that we are, but it'll shape us and move us into being God's people in new ways. So my prayer for you, uh, as you are hanging out on your couch in your PJs, is that uh, you can find some good music I listen to this podcast called All Songs Considered, and they always end it by, have a great weekend and treat yourself to lots of great music. So have a great Christmas. 
and treat yourself to lots of great music. Be surprised by the presence of Christ in your life. Know in the depth that God has been the God who has been reaching out to us to save us, to bring peace and joy and grace since the beginning of time. And know that today you get to sit on your couch, but in the end we get to go out and we get to bring that grace and that peace, that joy, that hope to a world that desperately needs it. Have a great Christmas and treat yourself to lots of great music. Hey, I almost forgot. I dressed up for you. I, I wore my old man cardigan so that my kids would know that it's me. But I also wore my Abbey Road shirt. Come on. One of the other things that you need to think about is what music moves you. This song, this album, was one of the only records that my parents bought besides Engelbert Humperdinck or Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass. Anybody know that? I had grew up on Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass and Abbey Road. And a number of years ago, my daughter decided that she wanted to get me a Father's Day present, one of my daughters. This is what she got. And gifts are like that, like music. They're surprising, but they also have meaning to us. And they actually get us to go out and to do something and to love the world. So not only listen to great music, but remember to give great gifts too. Thanks. As we conclude today's service, let's sing Build My Life.
On behalf of Cedarview Alliance Church, we just wanted to say thank you for joining us this morning, and special thanks to Blair for covering for me on this Youth Pastors Sunday. We just wanted to send you off into the new year with a special New Year's blessing. So may the God who gave us this year, and the Savior who walked by our side every step of the way, and the Spirit who filled us with life abundant, grace the coming year with peace and hope and joy. Happy New Year.